Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we're continuing our series on the colonies during the English Commonwealth. Today's episode takes us to Connecticut, where in 1649 the English Civil War did not seem to change much of their policy making. In May, John Haynes was chosen governor of the colony again, which continued this pattern, if you've been following the podcast, of John Haynes and Edward Hopkins switching out the role of governor every other year. They would each serve alternating one-year terms. The legislative body of Connecticut, known as the General Court, seems to really care about the United Colonies and what they want to do in terms of issues. For example, in May 1649, Connecticut really wanted to limit trade with the natives, but they believed their policy would not stop members of the United Colonies from coming to the region and trading. Therefore, instead of weighing in on the issue themselves, they sent their commissioner to the United Colonies to consider this. Now, that is a stark difference, in my opinion, to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which, as we've seen time and time again, they're just going to pass the law. And I think they are more or less becoming the power broker in the region. There was also another issue. Let's have a look at the writing. Upon reading the acts of the commissioners for the United Colonies, it was observed that in the agitation of the difference between Massachusetts Bay and this, in reference to the imposition required from Springfield, upon some goods passing out at the mouth of this river towards the charge expended at Seabrook. So what that is, is Springfield as we've talked about before, used to be in Connecticut, but they switched their allegiance over to Massachusetts Bay earlier in the decade. Springfield did not believe they should pay to send goods down the river through Connecticut. Connecticut stood their ground on this issue, so they didn't act like they did on this uh, trade issue. They presented an expressed order detailing the duties for the transportation of goods down the river. 2 pence per bushel of corn, 20 shillings per hogshead of beaver. And one has to admire the Connecticut colony here sticking to their guns, it's sticking to their guns against the Massachusetts Bay economic powerhouse. The action ends up being deferred in the United Colonies meeting, so no action taken at this time. The colony was concerned with a handful of families who were living in rural Windsor near native populations. The colony requested a member of each household receive some type of militia training. We saw this in Massachusetts Bay as well, and one could assume that the United Colony Commissioners had been in conversation with each other about what they're worried about. They're worried about their rural families out there. In September 1649, the general court weighed in on the trading with natives, and they weighed in on this issue by forbidding anyone in their territory, no matter the nationality, from trading with the natives. The assembly also distributed the militia, and I believe they did this based on population. But the militia consisted of 45 men, 13 from Hartford, 11 from Windsor, 8 from Wethersfield, and the new towns of Fairfield and Stratford sent a combined total of 13. The 1650 legislative session in Connecticut was dominated by the adoption of the Code of 1650. Let's have a look at the intro. It is therefore ordered by the court and authority thereof that no man's life shall be taken away, no man's honor or good name shall be stained, no man's person shall be arrested, restrained, banished, unless it be by the virtue of equity of some express 
law of the country warranting the same. So an interesting intro there, somewhat of a Fourth Amendment tone, Fifth Amendment tone a little bit, but also the fact of the matter is you, in habeas corpus, you can't be held or arrested for just no reason. This code was 50 pages long and covered a variety of laws. Under the capital laws, parents could have their child put to death if they were over the age of 16 and rebellious, living a life of crime. Interesting. Under cattle, owners of cattle and mares who escaped their pens would face a whipping and imprisonment. So now there's definitely an incentive for cattle ranchers to keep their livestock in. Cattle were also required to be marked. The code also covered fraudulent conveyance, fraud essentially, illegal fires, forgery, fornication, gaming, and idleness, also known as laziness. The March 1650 court repealed wage and price laws. The court did suggest prices if two persons or multiple parties could not come up with an agreement. So Connecticut's days of price fixing end in 1650. In May, the court passed a law forbidding any foreigners from selling goods in the colony. In September, a surprise visitor arrives, New Netherland director Peter Stuyvesant. He came to negotiate the boundary of the two colonies with then Governor Edward Hopkins. So he's looking at what would be Connecticut's western boundary. We talked last week about how the northern boundary of Connecticut wasn't set. So now they're looking to set a boundary to the west. And this would be a good thing for them to do because as we had talked about in previous episodes, the Dutch had been encroaching over for over a decade now. They've peeled back just a little bit because of problems that they had in the 1640s. But still, if you can come to an agreement on a boundary, the probability of an armed conflict is going to go down greatly. They end up agreeing on a boundary and using a treaty called the Treaty of Hartford. And except for a few minor adjustments, the treaty essentially established the boundary that is today modern-day Connecticut and modern-day New York State. So that treaty has held up now for over 350 years. So it's good to see that treaty come about and hopefully between Connecticut and New Netherland that reduces the probability of conflict. In February of 1651 the court prohibited colonists from buying land from the natives. So while Rhode Island right next door to the east is engaged in land transactions with natives, these actions are illegal in neighboring Connecticut. In April of 1651, the Connecticut court system, which was at this time comprised of the governor, deputy governor, and other judges, sentenced husband and wife John and Joan Carrington to death for witchcraft. Like the other witchcraft-related executions we've covered, little is known about the Carringtons other than John was employed as a carpenter by trade and that they had purchased land in both 1647 and 1649. When they died, their estate was worth a modest 23 pounds against debts of 13 pounds. This witchcraft execution was a little more unique than those we previously covered because it involves a husband and a wife, spouses. Several descendants of the Carringtons have tried to find out what caused these allegations to come up. There's nothing in the primary sources, and I have a sense that some of these records may have been later on destroyed for fear of embarrassment, because other crimes 
that are documented are documented extensively, especially in Massachusetts Bay. And so for no primary documents to be found regarding their indictment and executions is just disappointing. Now, the Carringtons, interestingly, as I talk about this, uh, one of their descendants has actually reached out and commented on our Connecticut Witch Trials episode. And that was after that episode aired, after I had written this episode, and before uh, today's taping. So I think it's exciting that we have descendants of people we're talking about on this podcast coming forward. It's unfortunate that I don't have any additional information for them, but would invite them to share whatever they have in the comments. In May, a woman by the name of Ruth Payne was hanged for witchcraft as well. Now, specifically here, they note satanic practices such as the congregating with wolves. And for me, that just raises even more questions. Not only who does that, but who would witness that? How would that come about in terms of an allegation and proof? It seems right now that the Connecticut witch hysteria is reaching a much higher fervor than what we talked about last time with the Connecticut witch trials. And if anybody has any additional information on those specifically primary sources, please feel free to share in the comments. There was plenty of uneventful notes in the legislative session in 1651, but in October, the general court noted that there were plenty of natives among them who had a desire to be murderous. So here we go again with kind of the paranoia in Connecticut. Seeing as the colony is engaged in militia training and hanging witches, uh, it's possible these suspicions could escalate into further problems. 1651 did witness the founding of two new towns in Connecticut, Litchfield and Norwalk. It seems that peace and stability, and, and frankly indifference, have allowed the Connecticut colony to hum along aside from the events going on in England. Again, the witchcraft and the witch hysteria and the paranoia seems to be higher here than in other colonies, but they don't seem to be influenced by anything happening in England. But events in late 1652 would ultimately draw the colony into conflict. And that will be covered in a future episode. But next week, we're going to head over to Rhode Island, which probably suffers the most dramatic factioning of the colonies. Rhode Island actually splits into two. And we'll talk about that next time on Historical Context. <laughs>